morning. How many of you heard that I wrote a book? Anybody hear about that? A bunch of people. I am so, so proud of this book. Here's a picture of it for those who haven't seen it. It's <laughs> Humility and How I Achieved It, Dr. Clay Peck. The only, I'm really proud of this book, but the, and really, I'm talking about humility today because I'm an expert on it, but um, the only downside was they printed it before I could make the changes. I wanted to change my name to a bigger font and, and, and make it the Honorable Reverend Dr. Peck. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, I did write a book and I plan to give it away in two weeks at our 25th anniversary. We're going to have a big party. I hope you'll be here for it. But my book is called The Main Thing, not Humility and How I Achieved It. Uh, Paul W. Powell once observed, pride is so subtle that if we aren't careful, we'll be proud of our humility. When this happens, our goodness becomes badness, our virtues become vices. We can easily become like the Sunday school teacher who, having told the story of the Pharisee and the publican, said, children, let's bow our heads and thank God that we're not like Pharisees. Have you ever heard it said, pride goes before a fall? That's out of the Bible, actually. And uh, I, actually, I read a story this week about it that illustrates it. It's a story about two ducks and a frog. And they lived in a certain pond where they were neighbors and they became friends, two ducks and a frog. You with me here? And, and the water started to dry up as the season was changing and they realized they had to move south for the winter, but they didn't want to leave the frog behind. Finally, they decided what to do. The frog would pack up all of his winter clothes in two little suitcases and hold them in his little hands. And then the ducks would pick up a stick between their bills and he, the frog would latch onto the stick with his mouth and they would carry him to another pond. And so they did. And as they took off, the farmer said to his wife, what a great idea. Look at those ducks. They must be great friends with that frog. They're taking him south for the winter. That's a perfect plan. I wonder who thought of that. Proudly, the frog opened his mouth and said, I did. <laughs> Thus illustrating, pride goes before a fall. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 18 actually, seriously, says this. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, sometimes we misunderstand the idea of humility, which is our theme today. Uh, sometimes we think that it means self uh, de deprecation, where we're just like kind of putting on kind of a false humility. For example, if you were a reporter and you were able to interview Tom Brady, in case you don't know, Tom Brady has won seven Super Bowls, which is unheard of. A and imagine if you would say, how does it feel to be the GOAT, you know, greatest of all time? A and if he answered, well, I don't know about that. I I'm not sure about that. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't know if I'd go that far. If he started talking like that, it wouldn't sound very genuine because of what he's accomplished, right? But it, but it, it might feel more appropriate if he said, well, I guess if you count my seven rings, I have had a fortunate career. I struggle with that as a young pastor because at first when people would come up to me and say, good sermon, I didn't know what to say. And so I'd, I'd feel like I had to give the credit to the Lord somehow, which of course the Lord does deserve the credit all the time. Um, obviously, no doubt. But I, finally, I came to realize that I could just say thank you to a compliment, too, without trying to, you know, muster up some sort of false humility. When we talk about humility, we're not talking about low self-esteem. We're not talking about high self-esteem. We're talking about high God esteem. You see, when I esteem God highly, then I start to esteem myself in a different way. Not that I think less of myself, but I learn to think of myself less. Today we're coming to the end of a 30-week series. Basically all year with a few little breaks, we've been in a belief series. 10 weeks on core beliefs, 10 weeks on core practices to maintain our relationship with the Lord. And this summer, 10 core virtues that, that are being formed in us as we walk with the Lord. And I hope this has been a helpful uh, stretch for you, for your spiritual journey. I've uh, received a lot of good feedback and I've, it's been helpful for me. Well, I started out today with a little levity, but this message is going to get serious because we're going to actually walk on some sacred ground together as we go into Philippians chapter 2. This is a very unique passage. We're going to start with verses 
three to five before we get to the, the heart of where I want to focus today. It says there, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He's been describing the gospel in earlier verses, and now he says in response to what Jesus has done for you, here's how you should live. You should pattern your life after him because he actually gave us an example of humility and being willing to humble himself to serve others. And that's what he's calling you to have his mindset, to have a new mindset. Okay, so now before we read the example of how he humbled himself in the next verses, let me just say that there are passages in the Bible that you might think of as mountaintops when you come to them. And if that's the case, this is one of the highest peaks in all the Bible. In fact, what I'm about to read, I even feel a little bit of apprehension about commenting on it because it's so profound. And I, I, feel, I feel like a little bit like Moses when he came to the burning bush and he, he took his shoes off because he was on holy ground. See, these next verses we're going to read, scholars believe they represent an early Christian poem or creedal statement, likely a hymn that the early church sang together. Whether Paul or somebody else wrote it, they probably were well uh, it was probably well known. They were familiar with it when they read it in his letter. This conclusion comes from studying the style of the Greek writing and noting that it's arranged in six stanzas with three lines each, distinct parallelism, repetition, and rhythm. So here we have a succinct statement of what the earliest Christ followers believed about him. And the beginning of this passage takes us from the highest heights to the lowest depths. You see, Jesus didn't climb a ladder to success. Instead, he descended into greatness. Here it is, first part of the hymn, Philippians 2, 6 through 8. It just said to have the same mindset of Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now the next three verses are also a part of the hymn, and it's a powerful transition, but we're gonna get there at the very end. For now I wanna break down this passage and show you six downward steps Jesus took as he modeled humility and as he came on a rescue mission for us. Number one, Jesus was eternally God who in being in very nature God, the text begins. You don't get any higher than that. That's as high as it gets. Jesus was never created. He is the creator. He's not a God, little g. He is in very nature God, capital G. Now, it's impossible for our finite human minds to grasp because we live in a world where everything we know has a beginning. So we have to accept this by faith because we can't hope to understand it, and, but we can receive it. And God's word clearly teaches that Jesus existed eternally. He is before all things. Now, Christianity is, a, is, is unique among all the other religions in that it teaches, and only it teaches, that there is one God who exists in three personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, the Godhead, the Trinity. In John 17, 5, Jesus prayed that the Father would glorify him with the same glory they had together before the world began. I had a conversation a while back with a young man who was asking some good questions. I love these kind of conversations. But he was expressing some, some doubts or some, some thoughtful questions. And he said, if God created this world to have someone to love, then God must have needs. And if he needs us so that he can have someone to love, then how can he be the almighty God? The answer is found in the reality of the Trinity. You see, only Christians, Christianity teaches a triune God. God is three in one, eternally so. And that has implications. St. Augustine long ago said, if your God is alone, then he's not much of a God. Why? Because if God were alone, follow me there, then he 
he would have never loved until he created. But if God always existed in loving community, then he did not create to get love, but to give love. Jesus was and is fully eternally God, but he humbled himself in order to go down the dark shaft on a rescue mission. Notice his descent, number two. Jesus laid down privileges, rights, privileges, and power. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. See, Jesus was equal with God, but he did not regard that privilege something to be grasp in such a way that he would hold on to it no matter what. He did not feel he had to pull himself higher or cling to his rights. Jesus was the opposite of Adam. Adam was not equal with God, but he sought to grasp a higher status. Jesus was equal with, with God and was willing to let go of his rights in order to move to a lower status. And the text says, literally, he emptied himself. It's an interesting Greek word, kenosis, which has caused a lot of discussion among scholars, whole books have been written about it. And some have come to wrong conclusions and, and they've, they've decided that when he emptied himself, he ceased to be God. Or that when he emptied himself, he was like he was stripped of all of his divinity, his divine attributes at least. But the reality is Jesus never ceased to be God. What he did is he willingly laid down divine rights, privileges, and power in order to live as a man. Think of it this way. He chose willingly to lay down the independent use of his divine power so that he could provide an example of complete dependence on God. And in that sense, he emptied himself. He laid down rights, privileges, and power for a purpose. Number three, we're taking steps down. And, and it says tr Jesus truly became a human, made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a human being. Jesus was fully human Fully God at the same time, but became fully man as he entered through the womb of Mary, through the miracle of the Holy Spirit, became a part of his own creation. And every Christmas we wonder anew at the mystery of the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was never a sinner in need of a savior. Think of him like Adam before the fall. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 says, he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. I believe his biggest temptation was to rely on his own power rather than depending on his father. And that's a temptation that we also have, but it was much greater for him because he, he had the power. Now, this is turned into some real theological thinking here because of what's the nature of this passage. I want to encourage you to stay with me here, but stop here for just a moment and make application to your life. First of all, Jesus is God. That means no problem is too big for him. Okay, no matter what you're facing, please remember that. And, and, and try this and learn this. Don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your God is. Furthermore, Jesus became human. And that means he understands what you go through. He really does. He understands all the broad categories of what we face. He was tempted. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. He was lonely. He was falsely accused. He was abandoned. He was in pain. All the things that we struggle with, he struggled with. And on the other hand, he laughed and enjoyed good food and companions. And, and he really does understand us. Now watch the further descent of this passage. Step number four, Jesus became a humble servant, not just a man. But taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself. Now, Jesus could have come to this earth as a king. He is the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he deserves honor and praise and worship forever. And if he would have showed up in his majestic glory as king, we would have, we would have been impressed. But he came, he chose to come instead as a servant. And the Greek word doulos literally means slave. This is not how kings and queens usually roll, <laughs> how they travel. Philip Yancey, in, in the book, The Jesus I Never Knew, speaks of when Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth II visited the U.S. a number of years ago. And let me, let me quote. Her 4,000 pounds of luggage, I think, whoa, man, I thought my wife took a lot. Nah. 4,000 4, pounds of luggage included two outfits for every occasion, a mourning outfit in case someone died, 40 pints of plasma, a white kid toilet seat cover, leather, white kid leather, 
She brought along with her own hair, she brought her own hairdressers, two valets, a host of other attendants. A brief visit of royalty to a foreign country can easily cost $20 million. That's how nobility rolls. He continues, in meek contrast, God visited to earth. God's visit to earth took place in an animal shelter with no attendants present and nowhere to lay the newborn king but a feed trough. Indeed, the event that divided history and even our calendars into two parts may have had more animal than human witnesses. Here's what we need to understand. Jesus came to implement and to inaugurate God's kingdom. And it is an upside down kingdom from the kingdoms of this world. We love to hear rags to riches story, popper to king, janitor to CEO, log cabin to White House. But Jesus went down, descending into greatness. Jesus told his disciples, if you want to be great, you need to learn to serve. And then he didn't just say it, he modeled it. He got down on his knees and he washed the disciples' dirty feet, which was not only hard to do because it was dirty and smelly, but because it was considered undignified and not the role of a leader, the role of a servant or a slave in that culture. Jesus intentionally was modeling something for them and for us. Jesus taught that life is about giving, not getting. He said it's more blessed to give than to receive. He stated that he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Now here's something fascinating to me. By introducing humility as a virtue, Jesus changed the world. I first discovered this uh, from an author who I heard as a speaker at a global leadership summit and then uh, picked up his book. He wrote a book called Humility, or no, his book is called Humilitas. It's using the, the Latin word for humility, John Dixon. And in his book, it's a little book, but it's, it's profound, he shows how the ancient world did not like the idea of humility because they valued honor above all else. The Greco world, like many ancient cultures, was an honor-shame-based culture. And so much of life was oriented around how to obtain public honor, how to avoid public shame. Incidentally, I've been doing a lot of reading lately about Native American history, and when the first uh, European settlers made it out here to the Great Plains, we're just right on the west end of the Great Plains, the Indians of the Great Plains were very much an honor-shame-based culture as well. In fact, boys could only become men by performing some sort of feat of honor, and it usually meant killing something, like a buffalo or an enemy. And, and it was considered much better to die in battle than to show any cowardice. That was shameful. And uh, there's other examples of this, uh, maybe in mafia and gangs, and there's this honor sh and shame-based culture as well. But in the ancient world, it was certainly true. And if a Roman man had a wife who cheated on him and had an affair, he was likely to be much more concerned about the public disgrace than the loss of love. And if he was a father, he was probably less concerned with his son's happiness or even his morality than whether or not he could bring honor to himself and thus to his father. And that might be achieved through military conquest, political success, some other public recognition. People had to see it. Aristotle wrote, good reputation is a matter of achieving the respect of all the people or of having something of the sort that the general public or the good or the prudent desire. It's all about honor. Now, they, they did teach that humility before the gods was advisable because they could kill you in their, their thinking or before the emperor for the same reason. But never was there any... Uh, instruction or encouragement to show humility to someone of your equal or, or inferior status to you. It wasn't done. Humility was considered shameful behavior culturally. Ancient Greeks and Romans thought nothing of praising themselves in public. That was expected. The emperor Augustus, he wrote a book, an autobiography. He was alive when Jesus was born. He was the emperor ruling at that time. And he wrote an autobiography. You can read it. I've read part of it. And all it is is a list of 
things he's bragging about. Number one, number two, number three, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, I did this, I'm the greatest. And that was considered acceptable and normal behavior in that culture. But then Jesus came along. And he said things like, blessed are the meek. Love your enemies. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. The first will be last and the last will be first. You see, he was bringing an upside down kingdom. He was saying things people never heard. And he said things like this, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, in that culture, a rabbi's yoke was referred to as the system of teaching. So he's saying, if you're gonna take my system of teaching, let me recommend myself to you as one, of gen- as, as one who is gentle and, and humble. He goes on to say, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He gives gentleness and humility as reasons to embrace his teaching that is unheard of in that day. Before Jesus, humility was the stuff of slaves, not rabbis or respected leaders. And yet today, most of the Western world, regardless of their religious views, view humility as a desirable virtue without realizing that it was Jesus who changed that view for the world. For example, Jim Collins, a great business writer. I've read three of his books. First heard him at a global leadership summit as well, and then got his books Built to Last, Good to Great, and How the Mighty Fall. And Built to Last was about companies that lasted 100 years or more and what was similar amongst them. And then good to great was ones that were good, but they did certain things to become great and then comparing all those companies to see what was similar. And he found that the very best leaders, the CEOs of these companies had two characteristics. One, what he called steely determination. And two, an attitude of humility. He writes, and I quote, we were surprised, shocked really, to discover the type of leadership required for turning a good company into a great one. Compared to high profile leaders with big personalities who make headlines and become celebrities, the good to great leaders seem to have come from Mars. Self-effacing, quiet, reserved, even shy. These leaders are a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. They are more like Lincoln and Socrates than Plato or Caesar. You see, today people recognize humility as a virtue, but it is only because of Jesus through his teaching and modeling, he changed the worldview about humility. Here's how God feels about pride and humility. In fact, look at the screen if you would and read this out loud with me. One voice. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, look again at that verse and just think about closely what it's saying. I read past that a lot of times and just thought, yeah, God doesn't like pride, me being pride, and he'd rather have me be humble. Move on to the next verse. But, But think about what it actually says. It says, if I'm proud, God is going to do what? Oppose me. That's, ter- that's not a position I ever want to be in. I got to remind myself if I start feeling feelings of pride, I don't want to be in opposition to the mighty God of the universe. That's a terrible place to be. But look at the other side of the equation. If I'm willing to humble myself, and, and the text says that we read earlier, Jesus humbled himself. It's something that we can do. We can choose to humble ourselves. If I'm willing to do that, then I'm going to put myself on the right side of this whole equation, and God's going to show me what? Favor. Grace, some translations say. I can't imagine a worse thing than being opposed by the mighty God of the universe, and I can't think of a better thing than receiving his favor. And it's humility that puts me in the right posture for that. Jesus was a humble servant who, who descended into greatness, but his descent did not stop with step four. Number five, Jesus was obedient to death, verse eight. Jesus placed himself in submission to the Father and was faithful and obedient even to his death. And don't think, oh, that was easy for him because he already knew it was coming and he was the son of God. No, it wasn't easy because he truly became human and in his humanity, he struggled. Hebrews 5, 7 to 8 says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. 
to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. On the night before the cross, Jesus agonized in prayer. He sweat drops of blood and he prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Then, of course, he re resigned himself to God's will and said, yet not my will, but yours be done. It was a struggle. Jesus was obedient until death. But not just any death. Jesus suffered the worst possible death. The text says, even death on a cross. Again, we can move past these things so easily without getting the full weight of how it first hit the original readers and listeners. Because we, we've romanticized the cross, and rightly so. We appreciate the cross because of what Jesus did for us. So we have cross necklaces and embroidered cross on Bible cases and all kinds of nice crosses around. But not then. Death on a cross was reserved only for the despised, the most despised criminals, the political rebels and slaves. In fact, of the three methods of capital punishment in those days, crucifixion, decapitation, and being burned alive at a stake, crucifixion was regarded universally as the most shameful and indeed the most brutal. Polite Romans considered it obscene to even say the word cross. They, no one was wearing cross necklaces. Jews considered a person hanged on a tree or on a cross to be under the curse of God, and that was based on the law of God in Deuteronomy 21, 23. Cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. Jesus went as far down that shaft into the darkness as necessary to save you. Even death on a cross. And that's why we serve communion. It's to remember what Jesus did for us on that cross. That's why we celebrate. And periodically, we, we share together what we call the Lord's Supper. If, you didn't, if you'd like to participate and didn't get one of these little packets with the elements, um, our ushers will come down the aisles and catch your eyes. And there's two flaps on there, one for the bread and one for the cup. And while you're navigating that, please recognize something important. What happened to Jesus was unique. Not just some cruel, de degrading form of punishment, which it was, but lots of people have been tortured and murdered and martyred and all that, okay? This is something unique here. You guys, can come on up, up this aisle over here, please. Ushers on this side. You got some hands over here. What happened to Jesus was unique because he not, not only did he die, not only was he tortured, but he suffered the wrath of God against every person's sin. You gotta understand what was really going on there on that cross. Galatians 3.13 says, he became a curse as he bore our sins. Mark 10.45 says, he gave his life as a ransom for sin, for you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The, the divine exchange. And, and this reality made the death of Jesus different from anyone else's death ever before and the worst possible death ever because as our substitute, he bore the penalty for sin in himself, feeling like he was being eternally separated from the Father, tasting the death of every person, the second death, so that you don't have to taste that death, experiencing hell so that you don't have to. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With that in mind, let's pray before we take communion. Father, thank you for your incredible love for us. Thank you for your eternal plan of salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross, for going through with it, even when all your disciples abandoned you and seemed like no one cared. As we hold this bread, we remember your body on the cross that you took our place. As we, as we take this cup, we think of your shed blood for us, your redemption. 
And we realize that we could have never saved ourselves. We're eternally grateful to you. Our salvation comes from outside us, not from something we work up inside. And we're reminded of that every time we take this supper and eat and drink. It's in Jesus' name with great appreciation that we do so. Amen. Let's eat and drink. Now, I want to read you the last three verses of this ancient hymn. Jesus traveled down from the highest height to the lowest depth. You can't go any lower than the cross, atoning for the sin of humanity. But now we see a sudden turn from humiliation to exaltation as we read these glorious words in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? It's the name above all names, the text says. There are so many names and titles for Jesus, Christ, Emmanuel, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Almighty, Ancient of Days, the Door, the Chief Shepherd, the Good Shepherd, the Word, the Light, the Lamb, the Bread of Life, the Rock, the Bridegroom, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, the Alpha and Omega. But there's a name that is above all names, and that is Lord. The name trumps all the titles. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the earliest Christian creed. If you could say that and mean it from your heart, that's all it took. You're going to get baptized now. You believe that Jesus Christ is not just Lord, but your Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of all, and he's Lord forever. I hope that you have received Jesus, not just as Savior, but as Lord, as both your Lord and your Savior. And if you have not yet... Why not? And why not now? Why not why don't walk out of here? Why don't, why don't you walk out of here as a follower of Jesus, as, as your Savior and your Lord? All you got to do is just turn your life over to Him and take hold of the gift of grace by faith. You can do it right now in your heart in a, in a silent prayer to Him, and He will hear it. You can do it as you sing this song and take hold. Give Him your life and follow Him. And if you do that today, your next step is in two weeks. It's going public with baptism. That's what we read all through the book of Acts. That's what marked people's decision to become a follower of Jesus. Let's stand together and let's worship him from our hearts.